I V M. Welcome to Dreaming with Your Eyes Open. Ronnie Scruvala is an entrepreneur who I have admired for a long time. His ability to make inroads in an industry that is so tightly controlled by a few was what first had me so impressed. When he released his book a few years ago, I lapped it up. I was even more impressed. The more I discovered his journey and the various businesses he had been a part of, the deeper my admiration went. When this project came up, I jumped on it wholeheartedly. Where else was I going to get the opportunity to spend so much time discussing the ins and outs of his career and what he has accomplished? Hi, Ronnie. Hi. We're going to discuss today the chapter, uh, the thirteenth chapter of your book, "Dream Your Own Dream." So, as always, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a quote. Throughout this book, I've discussed foolish mistakes, setbacks, missed opportunities, and lessons learned over the years to highlight the challenges any leader will face when jumping headlong into tomorrow's markets. I've examined scale, staying the course, spotting trucks and trends, failure, and the role luck plays. Not much, if you recall. But to this, I want to add three words that I know will guide me as I regroup and work for the next two decades or more. Focus, choices, and empathy. I thought this was kind of crux, uh, a crux of the book itself. So I thought yes. maybe we can talk about these three things yes, a little it's bit a crux more. Yes, my life today also. So oh, yeah. Okay, all right. That's a good way to look at it. And let's kind of dive into each of these things a little bit, right? Yeah, so focus, focus, focus. Something I don't practice on too much, okay. and I would love to do much more on that. I'm do a five you, on ten right now, and I need to get to nine on ten. Do you do meditation or those kinds of things to improve focus? Ah, or? so I think yes, I do. Okay. I do. I do yoga very regularly. Okay. I do meditation for a decent period that of time. Helps? It helps, okay. but I still think that you know when you're when you're at that energy level where you want to do a lot of things, mm-hmm. your temptation to want to do things, multiple things, is always there. Right. Not and you know you know the impact of focus. So mm-hmm. that's where I think I'm excited, and I think I can. I'm good at multitasking, but I'm getting carried away. So okay. That's, that's what my rating would be. I think on empathy, I'm a, I'm a. I'm an 8 on 10 okay. uh, in the way I look at things. Now, okay. I know a lot of people I deal with on a work may not consider me to be high on empathy. Okay, But I think I understand that. And if I'm empathetic to the fact that somebody needs to get going on a certain right. level, I may be, uh, my approach may be much more blunter than mm-hmm. most people. Okay. But that doesn't mean I don't care. So right. I, that's my own benchmark. Of so you uh, contrasted empathy with sympathy, I think, quite well in, yep. in the chapter itself, yep. right? I mean, like, uh, would you like to kind of uh, talk yeah, about that a little bit? Yeah, because empathy is really a very different. Sympathy is, you know, having a shoulder, giving somebody a shoulder to cry on right. and listening to somebody and comforting them. Mm-hmm. And that's nice for the moment because that's solace. Right. But real empathy is having deep Firstly, it's a very strong sense of internalization of mm-hmm. yourself right? Uh, and understanding that. So I think I'm not saying to the level of spirituality, but it's mm-hmm. definitely something you need to feel. Okay. Uh, and then when you're really being empathetic, I think it's a lot more genuine okay. because it's not temporary. It has to be a lot more long term. Okay. When you say empathy is something that is more long term. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you contrast that with, right? I mean, like as opposed to what is, would you say, yeah, is a think, short-term because, uh, interaction? Well, not to blow that out of proportion, I think sympathy is more about at that moment when, okay. you're, when you're sharing sympathy with okay, somebody, you're right, giving okay, them sympathy. Okay, okay. Empathy is something you need to figure out. It's a characteristic more with you. Right. Because if I'm working in the Swadesh Foundation, mm-hmm. I need to feel empathy. Okay. If, I'm, if I'm being an upgrade and looking at the education business, empathy has to be a strong sense. Right. Because understanding what different students may go through and the challenges for that is right. integral for the success. Okay. All right. So you would look at empathy from the from the angle of entrepreneurship. You think that the essentiality yes, comes I from think, your being... I, I think if you want to really succeed, uh, empathy is a very important factor because you're not going to be able to build people unless you can get to that genuine level of empathy. Right. And I think the third point that you make over here is choices. choices. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, the obvious meaning of choices is that you have to decide between two things, right? But uh, what are you, when, when you're talking about choices in the context of this? In a sense that I think it defines you, right? right. I mean, choices really define you. Okay. So each crossroad that you are at, mm. it's not what you do and whether you turn right or left, mm. but it's the behavioral pattern actually when you're at that crossroad. So, okay. what you do. so I think understanding the importance of choices that will hurtle you forward to the next one mm. is quite important. Right. And I think we kind of uh, feel half the time, I don't have a choice, mm. which in itself I think is, is a, a problem. Choice. Right. So, so that's why to me, 
that context of dropping out, oh, I, I didn't realize I had a choice. No, no, you have that choice. And frankly, you need to exercise that. Right. And that's going to be a differentiating factor. And if that means you need to pause, pause. If you need to change, change. If you need to take a hard call, take one. So entrepreneurs in India, do you think they do a good job of identifying the choices they have in a specific situation? I think it's an iterative process. Okay. I don't think anyone can get a ranking on it. Right. So I would not like to opine whether it's a good choice or a bad choice. Right. And I wouldn't even say that it's India or anywhere else in the world. It's mm-hmm. quite a universal thing. Okay. It's very personal, but it's very, very, very critical. Okay. So, you know, if you were to ask to most people ascribe the importance you need to on choices, hmm. maybe not. Right. But it's an iterative process. So I, I get that, but I'm, I'm, my, my question is more along the uh, lines of, do you think people do a good job generally? Okay, let's forget India, but yeah. just generally. Do you think people do a good job in a tough situation of identifying what are the choices in front of them? Or do they kind of get into a mindset of lock-in at some point? Yeah, I think, so again, I don't want to make a general comment of whether I think people are bad or good, because right. I think it's a it's a slow process. Sure, it's a process course. that I said is iterative. But I think it's at what stage in your life you're going to realize how important that is, is going to be the most mm-hmm. important. Some people can realize that at 25, mm-hmm. because you've had some hard knocks. Okay. Some people take those choices in their education. Some people take their choices in their career. Some mm-hmm. people take their choices in their family decisions. Mm-hmm. But a combination of them are, is, a, is the important one. Okay. Uh, the, the reason I was asking or I was trying to dig down in this, right, because the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is uh, this quote that you have in the uh, in the book. In my experience, leaders and founders often fail to realize the anticipation of failure is infinitely more stressful than its reality. And that even the worst case scenario is never as bad as it seems. Right. right? Uh, where, where you're talking about basically worst case scenarios, plan A is plan B. Yeah. Should you have a plan B? You're talking, yeah. uh, that, that was the context yeah. of what you were discussing yeah. here. But I thought that what I kind of got out of this statement is that uh, sometimes we don't understand our choices in front of us as entrepreneurs. And I, uh, that's not, I think, what you were trying to say here. No, no. I think it is much more with exactly what the line said, uh-huh. which is, uh, you know, that uh, it can't be as bad as it seems to be. Right. I think that's your know, worst case scenarios have to be calibrated. Right. One of the things that you talked about in this chapter, which I thought was kind of interesting, was the plan B versus the survival plan, right? And I think that is something that people don't differentiate well between, yeah. right? I mean, like, uh, so what would you call a plan B and what would you call a survival plan? Yeah, I know. Plan? I, it's a little tricky. And let me just put that into context firstly. What I meant by that is, you know, in management schools and in theoretical situations and when you're growing up business plans and when 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 investors are talking to you or when you're having a discussion at a board level, you might always say, well, what's plan B? Right. But I think when you're at the leader and you're out there driving something, that absolute context that I don't have a choice and I therefore need to go with plan A because plan A is obviously your best option. And most people kind of, when you have a plan B and a plan C, it's almost like you have an exit door, right? And then you feel, okay, well, I always have that option. So my key criterion was the more, uh, the less I have a weightage on plan B and C at that time, the absolute more drilling I'll do on plan A. Mm. And the probability of shattering some of the uh, perceptions, glass ceilings or whatever that may need to be done is important. Mm. So it's a tough one because you can land and you can say, oh, well, if I don't have a plan B and a plan C, I just go at it like a madman, right. I might fall off the cliff. Yeah, but sometimes it's not, it, you may have a problem where the plan B will be such a compromise. Mm. So it was much more about putting that thought in your mind that have you given your plan A its best? Right. And can you, if you're constantly thinking of the exit doors on your plan B and C? Will that work for you? So you talk about a survival plan versus a plan B, right? So is... Um, yeah, so and just I think that's, that's very important because... Most people, when you make a plan, mm. you have a success plan. Right. So in your success plan, you have your idealistic revenue right. uh, approach or your goals in terms of timelines. And then you have a cost that gets attached to that. Right. What happens is that like all things in, in business, you first spend the cost mm. and then hope the revenue comes in. Right. All your goals are met. And that's the biggest tragedy. Right. So you need to have your survival plan that says, if I haven't met that, and that's not one of those situations where you have fixed cost and variable costs. Mm-hmm. It's not one of those kind of situations. So if you have a survival plan, you kind of acclimatize your mind to your worst case scenarios. Right. Okay. And I think that's a good place for you to be. Mm-hmm. It may not be the best thing for you to share it with people, mm-hmm. but you need to have it. So do you think sometimes, uh, and again, uh, the way I would look at this, right? I'll take the example of the business that we're in in the podcasting space, which would be, I think, somewhat similar to what UTV was when it was primarily a production company, right? 
plan A is build our own IPs and try and do as much as we can with that, right? And try and uh, exploit that as much as we possibly can. Plan B would be to become a production house where we're doing production for different people. And plan C would be where we just basically cut things down to the bone and just kind of survive on everything that. Yeah. Does that sound like what you mean by no. plan A, plan no. B, plan so C? So if, if I'm very clear, I want to be a B2C company, a right. consumer-facing brand, right. then that would be my plan A. And any if so, but so's on that right. would not be that I take the whole business and redefine it into a B2B segment. Okay, But it would be... If my B2C business had two different avenues right. of revenue, do I need to have a third or a fourth? Right. Okay. Do I need to get my cost model right? And do I, if I think success was going to be in two years, mm-hmm. my survival plan is what if it takes four years? Right. Not what if I don't make it and therefore should I go to another completely different Correct. business Correct, right, right, right. So to me, I think uh, the survival model is not actually taking yourself down. Okay. It's actually ensuring you stay afloat but you with a, with a sense of reality. Okay, all right. That's actually very clarifying. Before we end, there, uh, there are two more things I wanted to kind of actually talk about. So one is, uh, so I'm going to get into something which is, it, it's part of this chapter, but it did not seem like it was uh, part of the narrative of the rest of it. You were talking about sports as a metric for, country, uh, for a country's success, right? And I thought that was a really interesting point that you made over there. Sure. Why do you think that that is the case, right? It's such a unifying thing. Right. People need role models in life. People need inspiration. People need something to hold on to. When you have a general election, you look towards a leader. A leader is going to drive the nation, create a democracy, whatever else. There isn't that many more binding things than A, if you're in a war and Mm -hmm. therefore you feel nationalistic about something. Right. Or as I said, when you're looking at... So I think sports is a very binding one. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately for India, we're a single sport country still. So the only relation we can have there is when we have a Cricket World Cup, for example. But if you look at that, you're cutting through all demographics. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone and everyone is rooting for a common cause. How often do you get that? Mm -hmm. And I think sports allows you to do that and yet be sporting. Okay. That means even if even if you don't make it, nobody's lost in the process. You just moved on, but it was a sense of excitement and passion. So I think that's why it's a very strong unifying thing. Mm. And if you can bring that to a you know, to a billion people, right. then you know what leadership style can be for anything else. Interesting. I also really like the comparison, or not the comparison, but the, uh, the, uh, the point you made around the fact that, or the thought that when India wins 20 Olympic medals, at that point in time, we will know that our country is already, it's already achieved what it needs to economically, yes. right? Yes, because there's a respect for excellence. Uh-huh. You know, you don't get to win 20 Olympic medals unless there's an incredible sense of commitment and okay. pre-planning. Uh, there's a DNA change. Hmm. Um, yeah, and it's a humongous sense of natural pride. Right. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I, I, I thought it was interesting because I uh, I actually got, I get what you're saying here, but I actually took something else away from it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the way I read, when I read that, what I thought was uh, this idea that uh, Olympic sports particularly, yeah. right, are not necessarily commercially driven sports for the most part. Yes. Some are, but mostly yeah. they're not, right? Yeah. So the way I saw it was that, okay, the, that you will only be able to achieve success in the Olympics when the country is economically prosperous. So I kind of looked at it in the opposite direction. There could be a connection in yes. that. Um, but it is because you, then sports is not going to get the time, investment and money and career That's, options that it would unless you were genuinely at least a developed or developing country. Especially Olympic sports, right? I mean, like I'm guessing cricket or even now Kabaddi or volleyball or football, these sports which have leagues yeah. which are coming up. There is a connection. But seeing this was much more in the context of binding force. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Okay, and uh, the last thing I want to end with uh, for this cha- uh, for this episode is uh, you rarely punctuate so dramatically, right? And so th- there is a sentence you have, or a series of sentences. Be honest, full stop, with yourself, full stop, at all times. I thought that was interesting the way you you punctuated that for this particular sentence because it means that you obviously really think very much about this. Yeah. Uh, so can you give us a little bit of what your thoughts? Yeah, are? I mean. Uh, I, again, I don't want to. Uh, the, the three full stops should articulate what I really <laughs> meant by that <laughs> primarily, because actually, that's. Uh, I think it's the be all and end all of many things, right? Because the uh, it's like you know the best way you're going to be able to figure out is that you're going to acknowledge you're a problem. Right. It takes a lot to say sorry, mm-hmm. but actually, it's the beginning of uh, turning around. Right. So in that context, I think just being honest with yourself. The key part is not the honest, because right. honest most people have a connotation about. A different sense of integrity, mm-hmm. honesty, and whatever. But actually, the key word there is to yourself. Right. 
because actually then you become your best judge your best critic mm-hmm. uh, your best benchmark and everything else and then you live life on your own terms awesome that's a great place to end this episode Lovely. thanks thank, thank you, you really thank you Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you enjoy listening to content on the IBM Podcast Network, let me tell you about a couple of things that you should check out this week. On What a Player, Mikhail and Akash recap the World Cup Finals 2019. They also discuss India's tour to West Indies, women's ashes, darts, tennis, kabaddi, and a whole lot more. On Pulia Bazi, Pranay and Saurabh discuss David Osborne and Peter Plastrick's classic book, Banishing Bureaucracy, and discuss ideas from it relevant to India. On the Filter Coffee podcast, Namrata Joshi talks to Karthik about her journey from being a journalist to now a film critic, her fascinating interviews in the industry, and her latest review of the movie Super Thirty. On the Habit Coach podcast, Ashton talks about the superset exercise, which is a super simple habit that makes us build muscles faster. He explains the relationship between muscles and calories and how one can amass muscle. Thanks, and we hope to see you again soon. Hey guys, I'm Mikhail Almeida. I host a, a podcast with my co-host Akash Mehta and Siddharth Reja on the IVM app. It's called What a Player. What, What a, a player. player. W A D D A P L A Y A H because illiterates can't find it on their own. No, and yeah. the H at the end is very important. What, What a, a player. player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it comes out every Thursday on the IBM app. Uh, tune in. We discuss everything sports, uh, all sports, uh, all, sports. all sports. Yeah, <laughs> mainly cricket, other sport in the middle, sandwich. <laughs> What happened to your language skills? Thursday. Don't worry, he talks better on the show. Yeah, <laughs> it's so, a great show. It has all things, including cricket and uh, things around sports as well. Yeah, and some personal life. As you can see, we're a very united podcast. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to listen to us, tune in to us every Thursday on the IBM Podcast app or ibmpodcast. dot com. 